Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... A few months ago, I uploaded what I considered to be the top three underrated books by Stephen King. Which, I understand a lot of you are thinking that due to Stephen King's popularity, that he doesn't have any underrated books. But trust me, he does have a few, and I do consider his novel Rose Matter to be among those. Now, after I uploaded this video, I received a message from my good online friend Lisa G, who explained she had never read Rose Matter before, which, of course, I urged her to stop what she was doing and read this book right away. Then I discovered she had a birthday coming up, so I offered to do this as a birthday buddy read with her, which she accepted. And before I start my review, I would just like to say that I was so very happy to finally read a book with Lisa, because we had been online friends for two years now, and we had yet to read a book together. So that was a really fun experience, especially when it came down to discussing the characters and themes. And Lisa, if you're watching this, I hope you had a great birthday, and I hope you enjoy this review. Also, I just really appreciate you reading this with me and all of the discussions that we had. So, with that said, let's go on and start our review and see what happens when Rosie decides to buy some art for her new apartment. Rose Matter by Stephen King introduces Rosie Daniels, who one day decides to leave her abusive husband Norman after having been with him for 14 years. And even though she really doesn't know where to go, she gets on a bus that takes her far away from him, where eventually Providence leads her to a shelter for battered women. From here, a few months pass where Rosie has been able to get on her feet, and she meets a guy by the name of Bill, who is the handsome son of a pawn shop owner. Which, upon them meeting in the pawn shop, this is when Rosie finds a Greek-themed oil painting of a mysterious woman in a rose-colored dress. And even though it mentions this painting really isn't much to look at, Rosie feels like this work speaks to her soul, and she feels like it would be perfect in her new apartment. Shortly thereafter, Rosie discovers this is no ordinary painting. Instead, this is actually a window that allows her to cross over into an alternate world. And when she does this, she meets with the mysterious woman in the rose-colored dress, where she becomes Rosie's ally. Meanwhile, Norman is hunting Rosie down because he wants to exact his revenge on her because she left him. Yet little does he know he's about to meet his match because the woman in the rose-colored dress owes Rosie a favor. Rose Matter was published in 1995 and is considered to be a part of the Abused Wives trilogy that includes Dolores Claiborne and Gerald's Game. Among the Easter eggs in this book, Rose Matter is a window into the Dark Tower series where the character Wendy refers to Ka, and when Rosie steps into the Rose Matter painting, she has actually entered the City of Lud, which is a city featured in the Dark Tower 3, The Wastelands. Other than the Dark Tower series, Rosie and Anna reading Paul Sheldon is a nod to the author held prisoner by Annie Wilkes in Misery. Also, the character Cynthia Smith makes her first appearance in Rose Matter, which King later used her in his novels Desperation and The Regulators. Fun Facts! Here's a few things you might not know about how Rose Matter was received. In the past, King has said, sometimes I feel like a baseball player, and that some books feel like singles and some books feel like doubles, and every so often you get a Rose Matter. Another time, King said, I've had bad books. I think Rose Matter fits in that category because it never really took off. In King's memoir on writing, King stated Rose Matter and Insomnia are stiff, trying too hard novels, and he felt like he forced the plot, making it march to his beat rather than letting his characters lead the way. Critics have complained that King was lazy with Rose Matter, saying how he didn't describe the painting well enough, or they have issues with how the mysterious painting appeared. 
Others have complained that the book presented lowbrow dialogue, the execution was dull, and that the book fell apart when the fantasy elements took over. One critic went as far as to saying Rose Matter was feminist tub-thumping. Despite all of the criticism Rose Matter received, King has frequently said that a lot of people approach him and say Rose Matter gave them the courage to leave their abusive spouse. Now that we have that covered, it's time to move on to the spoilers section, which, if you haven't read this book before, I'm about to reveal some things that could ruin the experience for you. So, if you would like to click away, scroll down to the comments, and you'll see that I have a comment pinned at the top, which has a timestamp in it. All you have to do is click that timestamp, and it will direct you away from the spoilers and bring you to the thoughts section. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go! Since everyone's had the opportunity to click away, I would like to talk about a few of my favorite moments, which the first one that comes to mind is the whole sequence after Rosie enters the painting. Now, in this alternate world, Rosie is greeted by Wendy, who is eventually revealed to be Dorcas in disguise. Then Rosie meets Rose Matter, which Rose Matter honestly feels like a physical manifestation of Rosie's abused half. But this is when Rosie discovers that Rose Matter needs her to enter a labyrinth so she can rescue Rose Matter's baby, which essentially this is the same baby that Rosie had miscarried when Norman had abused her. And as you might expect, the baby is being guarded by an irate one-eyed bull named Aranyas, which is equivalent to Norman. From here, Rosie goes on a journey where we see satyrs getting blowjobs, there's little boys with huge penises, there's rotting gardens, there's a tree of forbidden fruit, and there's a labyrinth full of literal shit. Which, after Rosie goes into the labyrinth, she tricks Aaron Yes, grabs the baby, and is able to reunite mother and child. But before Rosie is able to leave this world and go back into her own, Rose Matter explains to her that she repays. When I first read this in the 90s, I was really blindsided by this whole moment because I had no idea this book was going to take that turn. And even now as I read this with Lisa, it was really cool to see how she was just as surprised as I had been. Also, when I was a kid, I really loved this moment because of its brooding imagery and its suspense. And even now as an adult, I still admire it for those reasons. But now I do also understand the symbolism and the Greek side of things, especially since Lisa pointed out that Rose Matter's character was similar to Persephone. As far as symbolism is concerned, Lisa and I felt like the olive tree represented peace and friendship. Then she brought to my attention that there was some symbolic nudity in regards to Rosie stripping naked for her journey, which she felt like this showed how vulnerable Rosie was for the situation. Also, I brought to her attention the significance of the naked boy with the huge penis, and how I felt like he represented Norman, especially in a sense where it felt like Norman had never grown up from being a schoolyard bully, and the huge penis really just showed the extension of Norman's ego. But what really had us stumped was the literal shit-covered maze. And since this moved like a fever dream, I ended up googling shit in dreams and discovered that this can symbolize getting rid of something that is a psychological burden. Aside from symbolism, there is a lot of Greek mythology piled into this sequence. Like, for example, we have the chariot and the dead gardens, which these reference how Hades had used a chariot to kidnap Persephone while she was out picking flowers. Also, we have the bull in the labyrinth, which references the minotaur. And last, we have the pomegranate tree that Rosie is warned not to eat from, which Persephone had been abducted by Hades as she was reaching for a pomegranate. So, even though this has been one of my favorite scenes for the last few decades of my life, I'm glad to finally understand it better, and because of that, it's made me enjoy this sequence a great deal more. Compared to what I just discussed, my next favorite moment is extremely simple, 
which this is when Gertie gets her hands on Norman. Now, leading up to this, Norman had gone incognito as an injured army vet so he could sneak into the picnic that's being hosted by daughters and sisters. And even though he's in disguise, Gertie is noticing there's something up with this guy and she believes he's Norman. So from here, she ends up hunting the hunter. Well, as she's playing detective, Norman attacks one of the women from Daughters and Sisters. But before he can do any serious damage, Gertie comes up from behind and hands Norman his ass. Then, after she wrestles him to the ground, she drops her panties and pisses in his face. Despite this moment being as simplistic as what it is, the amount of joy that Gertie gave me when she pissed in Norman's face was astronomical. And like a favorite scene in a movie where you hit rewind and watch it again, this was a moment that I revisited time and time again, even as a kid, because I love how degraded Norman felt, which he totally deserved to feel that way. Also, I tend to think that this was the first moment where I had ever seen filth being glorified, and also where filth was used as a weapon against the victimizer. So, I really do like that approach, and I really admire Gertie for what she did, and for the longest, I have always considered Gertie's character to speak to my soul. The final moment I would like to talk about was when Norman bit the dust. Which, it's ironic for me to say this because Norman was a biter. But anywho, leading up to his death, Norman had attacked Rosie and Bill in the foyer. Then, after they were able to escape him, they went to Rosie's apartment where they hid in the closet. Which, this is where Rosie had stashed the Rose Matter painting. But, to their surprise, the closet has opened up into this doorway that has now allowed them to enter Rose Matter's world. From here, they're greeted by Wendy, who gets Rosie out of her clothes and puts her in the same outfit that Rose Matter had earlier been seen in. Also, Wendy explains to Rosie that she needs to meet Rose Matter at the palm granite tree. At this point, Norman enters and sees where Rosie is running off in the red dress, and he chases after her. But luckily enough, there's enough space between Rosie and Norman so Rosie is able to speak with Rose Matter in privacy once she gets to the tree. And this is when Rose Matter explains to Rosie that she needs to hide because she's about to act like she's Rosie and trick Norman. So at this point, Norman makes it over to Rose Matter and he thinks that Rose Matter is his wife. And when Rose Matter gets her hands on Norman, she shifts into her true form, which is this spider human thing. And once Norman has nowhere to go, she eats him. Having read this as an adult, I enjoyed it just as much as what I did when I was a child. However, now that I understood the Dark Tower series and Cosmic Horror, I was able to get a better grasp on the Rose Matter character as being a shape-shifting cosmic being. Which, in this regards, she reminded me a lot of Pennywise. And now that I understood her character a great deal more, I honestly felt like she was this really kick-ass anti-hero. Also, as a side note, even though Rosie had the opportunity to watch Norman die, she decided to turn away. And personally, if I was her, I would not have missed that for the world. Well, it shouldn't be hard to figure out who I'm going to bitch about here, because Norman was totally the poster child for everything that's wrong with the toxic mill. Like, he was a misogynist, a wife beater, a rapist, a racist, a homophobe, an anti-Semite, a crooked cop who abused his power, and the list continued. And there was not one single thing this dipshit did that was good for the entirety of the book. And I know you might be thinking, wow, someone this this shitty couldn't exist in real life, well, I beg to differ, because if you go online, I promise, all you have to do is just scroll the news or the comments and you will find someone with Norman's personality. But aside from that, as I've already mentioned, I was really happy when Gertie pissed all over Norman's face. And before that's taken out of context, let me clear something up here. No, I am not into water sports. That shit is nasty. But for the right price, you know how to contact me.
Although Rose Matter by Stephen King isn't a favorite among the author and some of his fans, I really feel like this book gets a lot of unnecessary hate, especially since I felt like the characters were engaging and the plot was interesting. Plus, the book does focus on quite a few topics that are still relevant today, such as crooked cops, domestic abuse, and the importance of sisterhood and the stigma that comes with that. Also, upon reading this, I noticed where there were a lot of biblical and Greek references that followed Rosie on her journey. Character-wise, the cast of Rose Matter might not be as complex or as layered as what we're used to with some of Stephen King's characters. And for the most part, it feels like everyone goes from point A to point B with little to no conflict. Which, truth be it, I'm okay with that because the characters still felt realistic and I was still concerned for the protagonist. However, Lisa and I did raise our eyebrows when Rosie got into a new relationship only three months after having left her abusive relationship of 14 years. Which, neither of us are condemning her for this, it's just that it seems like more time should have been invested in her self-care and therapy. But I am glad that she got with Bill versus getting into another abusive relationship, because in real life, sometimes, unfortunately and unknowingly, a person can go from abusive relationship to abusive relationship. So I was really happy to see how Rosie broke this cycle. Theme-wise, Rose Matter does focus on domestic abuse, and aside from what happens to Rosie, we gain a window of insight into Norman's childhood and see where he grew from being a victim into a victimizer due to his toxic home life. Which, this is no excuse for him to be a shitty person because we all have the freedom to choose, just like we all have to be responsible for our choices. So, aside from that little tidbit of information we gain from Norman, the spotlight is on Rosie as she receives a severe amount of abuse from Norman to the point where it actually makes her miscarriage. And eventually, it does mention that he sodomized her with a tennis racket, so she went through some really nasty stuff. Now, after being with him for 14 years, she finally decides to leave him. And I know some people are wondering, well, why did she wait so long? Which I'll get to that in a minute. But the important thing is, she did in fact leave her abuser. So in this regards, it makes me think that it's never too late to leave a predator behind. Another subject that came into play was crooked cops and a broken justice system. Which, this is something that was relevant then and is still relevant today. And to give a good example of this, we see how Norman and one of his cop buddies raped Wendy. Then, after they went to court, they had Wendy killed. And because Wendy was a black woman who had drug connections, the courts turned a blind eye to her case. Also, it's greatly emphasized that while Rosie is catering to Norman and all of his cop buddies one evening, she overhears their conversation about how all cops are like this one huge family and they have each other's back. Which, because of this, it makes her scared to try to escape Norman because she's afraid one of his cop friends or another precinct will turn her back in to him. Now, I could go on and on about this subject, but I think you get the picture. However, I did really appreciate the detective who took on Rosie's case because he wanted to bust Norman since he was a crooked cop. So, at least there's that. And last, this book focuses on female empowerment and sisterhood, and also the stigma that follows those subjects. Which, in this regards, it's pretty obvious that Norman had broken Rosie down pretty bad. And even though we don't gain insight into her self-esteem or the healing process, we understand that the sisterhood she gained at Daughters and Sisters helped her become a stronger, independent woman. However, Rosie still really didn't grab the bull by the horns until she received the Rose Matter painting. Shortly thereafter, she became empowered by the female subject in the painting, which is essentially an alternate version of Rosie. So, because of what follows, this indicated to me that others can only help you so much, and you have to be able to do the footwork to take yourself the rest of the way. Now, as far as the stigma that surrounds women shelters and feminists is concerned, King shows how the antagonist of this book stereotype those at Daughters and Sisters as being nothing more than man-hating lesbians. Which, as a reader, we see this isn't the case whatsoever. Instead, all these women want is to be treated with the same dignity and respect that any man would be given. 
and I'm really glad that King brought attention to this problem, especially since he shows how narrow-minded people stereotype and create lies about well-meaning organizations because those narrow-minded people don't want to educate themselves, which obviously this is a problem that's still relevant today. Above all else, Rose Matter is a journey of female self-empowerment and sisterhood. And while Rosie is on this path, she also takes a spiritual journey where some of the elements feel Christian and others feel Greek, which I've covered the Greek elements in the spoilers section, so I won't revisit those here. But as far as the Christian elements are concerned, I found it interesting how when Rosie arrived in town, she met a guy by the name of Peter who informed her of the women's shelter known as Daughters and Sisters. And because of his vibe and his duties, he honestly reminded me of St. Peter. Also, after Rosie arrived at Daughters and Sisters, there was a great emphasis put on the word providence, which means guidance of God. So, because of the indications that I received here, it really felt like Daughters and Sisters was Rosie's safe haven or her heaven. Then, aside from all of that, we have the Greek elements that come into play when we go into the Rose Matter painting. Which, by the way, I absolutely loved picking apart all of this with Lisa. Overall, Rose Matter didn't scare me, creep me out, or even gross me out. However, its avant-garde structure fascinated me as a kid and impressed me as an adult. And even though this book won't give me nightmares, I did enjoy the plot and I did like the characters. Rose Matter by Stephen King takes the battered woman trope and turns it into a cosmic horror story. And because of this, Rose Matter stands out compared to other stories in regards to battered women. And if you haven't read this before, I will say that the abuse isn't that extreme or prolonged except for one scene at the beginning of the book. So if you are a survivor of abuse, this book might not be for you. But on the reverse side of the coin, this book was very engaging and it presented a very liberating and metaphoric journey that made me stand up and cheer. So, for that reason, I do highly recommend Rose Matter, especially if you're looking for suspense drama that merges with cosmic horror. On to the questions. What is a Stephen King book that you would like for me to review? Also, since Rose Matter deals with artwork, who are some of your favorite artists? Well, as you can imagine, I have a pretty weird taste in art. Like, among some of my favorite artists, I would have to list the photographer known as J.K. Potter, which he did portraits of Poppy Z. Bright and Lydia Lunch back in the day, and they were just beautifully gothic, so yeah, I love his work. Also, I would have to say Clive Barker, because even though I'm a huge fan of his books, I do also enjoy his erotic photography and his paintings. And I would also have to say Salvador Dali, which he was honestly my gateway into bizarre art, because when I was in art appreciation in school, everyone else was just oogling over Van Gogh and stuff like that. But Salvador Dali, he totally had me from the very first image I saw, which was the one where all of these women were naked and they were formed into the shape of a skull. So... Yeah, I've always loved him, and I can't wait to see what your comments are, so load it up. Before closing out, I would like to give everyone an update. First off, I received this really cool little package and card from my friend Gina. It says, coffee please, and you have a little hand coming out of the coffee. That's really cute. And she also sent me this really kick-ass sticker, so I'm happy about that. And this little sticker as well, absolutely adorable. And this is what I really love. She got me a magnet of the Exorcist. So yeah, this is totally going to get used. And I would also like to say that I'm sorry this video is so late. My intention was to have it up last weekend, but we had the potential storms of Ida that was going to come through, so we were taking a lot of precautions and just getting ready for that disaster, but luckily it avoided us altogether, so we just received a little bit of rain. 
Then, as I was getting ready to start on this video, I had a really horrible flare-up of gout, and I also got really sick to the stomach. So, yeah, I'm really sorry that this video is late. I was hoping to at least have it up before Labor Day weekend, but no such luck. So, for those of you who are watching this, I hope you had a good Labor Day, and once again, just sorry about the delay. Now that it's time to close out, I would like to say thank you to Lisa G, as well as J.L. Mulvihill, which J.L. Mulvihill is a young adult steampunk fantasy author, and her books are available in print, ebook, and audio wherever books are sold. Also, I would like to say thank you to Melody Romeo, which Melody Romeo is a historic fiction fantasy author, and her books are available in print and ebook wherever books are sold. Also, Melody Romeo goes under the pseudonym Adele Lane, and Adele Lane is known for her books of same-sex fiction, which those are available in print and ebook wherever books are sold. Also, I would like to thank Nicholas Gray, which Nicholas Gray is a horror author whose books are available in print, ebook, and audio wherever books are sold. Also, I would like to thank the artist Lisa Shin, which you can check out her work on her Facebook page called The Art of Shin. Also, I would like to thank horror enthusiast Blake Kelly, and last but not least, I would like to thank my mom and grandma. And if you're wondering why I'm giving a shout out to these wonderful people, it's because they've had the opportunity to contribute to my Patreon account. And if you would like to contribute to my Patreon as well, I have included a link in the description section of this video. And for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos. And if you want a specific title tied to your name, just let me know and I'll add that as well. Also, I do have a $10 tier available where you will still receive the shout out, but I do creepy photography, so at the beginning of every month, I'll send you over one of my photos, and you can print it off, do whatever you want with it. So if you're able to do that, that's awesome. If not, no sweat. Just come back to this channel so we can continue having a good time together. And if you would like to follow me on social media, links to my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all in the description section of this episode. And if you have yet to subscribe, be sure to subscribe and click that notifications bell because I have more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week and sweet nightmares.